lock it in. I'm like, yeah, it's very tight. Alright, everybody, we're gonna set up. Uh, we're gonna start. You ready? So, beautiful thing to see. I mean, big ups to all the speakers. Chris put in this, Ali put in this last minute. Now I see we're gonna have to do it like Florida and get a good venue. Uh, we're get, we have big hitters here, and I'm, I know, guys, this isn't a big stage, but we'll get it next. Now that we got this uh, this COVID kind of thing, that we can do these more in person. So if you have a mask, put it on or not. Exciting times. Um, this is gonna be very impactful. Take the notes, right? What you're gonna learn from here is things that you can apply to your business. We did a we did a quick little training. I gave you a little app. This is experience on this stage. I mean, Chris has a better relationship with these incredible gentlemen here but apply it. The investments are coming back, or they're here, but they're coming back stronger. Um, this business, I started out myself in the wholesale investment world, and I migrated to the traditional side, but it's always good to have both. As I can assure you on this table, they're the, they're the kings of getting reductions on properties. It helps you on your traditional side of real estate. So I wanna dive into it. I, wanna, I want you guys to get a lot of stuff. I'm gonna let Chris, my partner, I'm, uh, take it over. He has incredible questions. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you for everybody coming. I appreciate everybody taking out the time to come and listen to these guys. And a big thank you for you guys for coming out and um, you know taking your time out and, and helping educate uh, and helping us educate everybody that wants to learn about the business. So give a round of applause for these guys for coming out today. So obviously the, the topic of tonight's um, event is how to learn to get into real estate with little to no money down uh, or little to no money at all in the business. Uh, we have some really incredible guys that have been in the business for some time. Um, and I personally know uh, a lot of their success stories and, and seen them from pretty much the beginning to where, where they are today. Um, and you know, we have like Jonathan Boyle, you have Saeed Hammond, you have uh, Paul and Glenn Gallucci, and you also have Ben Jean. Um, you know, these guys have some incredible stories and they've done a lot of deals that we've seen and you know, Paul and Glenn have actually probably had some experience working with these guys in, in funding some of their deals, so it's awesome uh, to have these guys here. Um, so let's kick it right off. I mean, we want to start off with really, you know, we're trying to educate everybody to see how they can get into the business um, and how they can help and how to really find a deal, how to uh, see what's a good deal from a bad deal, what's a good investment. We know that today's market is very saturated, right? So it's a little different than what we probably have been used to in the past. Um, so, you know, whatever tips we can get from today's market uh, would be great. So let's see, how, how do you, so we'll, we'll start with John, and we're going to use this mic uh, for everybody to talk to. You're really not going to hear it, uh, but it's more for our videographer, so you have, you know, better hearing and whatnot. So you have one there, too. You can pass it around. Uh, we're going to go one by one on questions, and hopefully we can get to the end. So, uh, John, I'll start with you. So how do you, how do you land your deals, right? So how, how do you go about finding a good deal in today's business? Like, how do you go about it? How do you prospect for your deals as an investment deal? Um, you know, good question. So, I mean, I would say that it's probably a 70-30 split right now when it comes to how we find our deals. 70% we get from wholesalers, uh, other agents, uh, and basically social media as a whole. Um, you know, someone in some of the Facebook groups, they may say like, oh, I have a deal at 123 Main Street. Like, a lot of people joke around and, you know, say, this is all I say and it's true. Uh, I just write, I'm interested, my email is, and then my email automatically pops up on my phone when I send it. Uh, so, uh, you know, everyone sees me do that. Now, the other 30% is from our cold callers. So, you know, we have some, uh, you know, like people calling for us. Uh, they call like three to 500 uh, phone numbers a day at least. And, you know, whenever a lead comes up, you know, we either myself or mostly our other partner, Mark, uh, he speaks to them and then we set an appointment to meet with the owner and see if it makes sense or not. Um, I, I don't know if there, there, yeah, th there's a lot to digest there. So, yeah, and, and everybody's gonna find everybody's gonna have a different tactic to use, right? So that's a good thing. That's why we want to have different people, different markets. Everybody farms a different market, so it's always good to see how everyone really digests the deal in that market. Um, so, Saeed, what about yourself? How, how do you how do you uh, figure out to find your good deals? Because I, I know your market's a little different. As well. Right. So um, I started off pretty much. Uh, 
Some of my first deals came, one of my first main deals came from, actually, um, this is a while back, 2013. I was helping somebody with a rental, and the lady actually was like, oh, maybe you can help me sell my house. And the house was just boarded up in Jersey City. This was back 2013 when prices weren't really high. And I'm like, sure, right? And like, I just, you know, got excited, was able to um, close it. But most of my deals are sourced through cold calling. Um, I, I built, um, you know, I've virtual cold callers, but before I actually uh, ran my office, had inside sales agents that were calling um, every day. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a numbers game, right? So we're reaching out to a lot of people. That's where most of my deals from now, that shift into now texting and calling and doing a combination of the both because a lot of people um, with the, the phone carriers now, they kind of gotten pretty savvy and your your number comes up as junk if you're mass calling a lot of people so now you got to include mass text messaging as well but you can't go crazy with that too because you can burn it up so then once you start getting into it you start learning um, kind of you know what levels or adding you know having several numbers sending out a certain amount of text every time so it goes through um, and then some obviously referrals um, I've gotten some great deals referrals and then driving for dollars I am I tell everybody I'm the worst person to drive with my wife hates <laughs> to drive with me because all the time I'm looking at lots um, that's how I got um, one of my new constructions just driving around looking at a lot researching uh, the owner, skip tracing them, getting their phone number, and reaching out to them directly. I'm more aggressive. I, I like to go chase deals, even though it's probably not the mindset I should have. Deals probably should come to you, but I like I, I like the chase of the deal. So, yeah, that's pretty much yeah, that's nice, how I get Nice, nice. And let, let's, let's, let's get down to Ben real quick. That way we keep the topic going. And we'll, All right. We'll, what, what do you feel? What's your way? I know, you know, I've seen you around for a while and you were in a couple different markets and now you completely changed your market from what I know you were used to. So um, for me, it's all to relationships. Most of my deals, I have a lot of uh, lenders I do a lot of business with. Never like a lot of times the loans is going bad. Someone is willing to sign off the, the deed, giving the house back. I have a lot of relationship. These lenders will contact me and say, listen, we have this property. This guy is willing to sign the deed over. So in two months, this property is going to come. Do you want it? Do you want to go look at it? And then that's basically one, one source of me getting my deals. The other source, I have a lot of REO agents who's, do, who's not doing like selling to the retailers. You know, they get banks properties where they manage the properties for the banks. They either do an eviction or either they cleaning the property. So I usually get like the inside scoop. This is what's happening. It's going to take a few days before it comes in the market. It could be a month. It could be two months. But there's month, I might get four deals. There's month, I might get two. There's month, I get six. And then I just keep the relationship. Or either an agent that sold one of my properties, they know somebody who's basically losing their home. What I will do is basically I will do it as a short sale and basically wait a couple of months until it comes. So if I don't get it from the bank, I either get it to the short sales or I get it to, to, to connections. So that's how I get my deals. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you. Now, how do you, as a lender, as a, as a private lender, how do you uh, <clears throat> help your guys maybe source deals as well? Or how do you help your guys, let's say, as a new investor that's coming into the business and they come to you with a deal, right? How would you help them source a new deal or if they have multiple deals to show you? How, how, how could you give them some advice? No, that's a good question. And I think uh, the advantage that, that Glenn and I have is if we started in the in the you know, distressed real estate business. So we've acquired, we've fixed, we've flipped. So we've done, you know, all this, the same things that the gentleman up here, you know, had said. And the key is you want to find a motivated seller, right? You want to find somebody that has a problem that needs to sell. Um, and you'd be surprised. A lot of people, they don't want to shop everybody in and out of their house and, and, and things like that. So I think um, over the course of the years from the lending side, right, we're seeing what works and what's what other people and borrowers are doing. Um, so, you know, to help them source those deals, we, we came before the Internet. Mm -hmm. So I was licking envelopes, sending, <laughs> sending envelopes with red, white, and green cards, you know, door knocking, you know, go, going to, you know, be networking. Networking was a huge thing and, and letting everybody know what you do because you'll be surprised. Um, you know, somebody had said to me, 50% of what everybody's going to tell you to do to get your deal doesn't work. 50% of it is not going to work. You just don't know what 50% it is. 
So my point is, you have to you have to be out there doing it and 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 spreading like the word that you're a buyer or you know you fix and flip houses. It could be something as simple as the barber that you go to mm -hmm. and he hears about it and he goes, "Oh man, you know Paul. Paul does this. He's in the business. Call." Uh, we sent a letter out a year ago and it got stashed in a drawer. We didn't get that return on it right away, but eventually we got the call. And I'm like, I always ask, how did you hear about us? Right. So driving for dollars is another big one. Um, we love that. Uh, Glenn, remember in Edison, I think he, he drove past the house. Uh, grass was this high. Wound up finding the person in Pennsylvania. And at the next meetup, the guy was saying, man, I drive past that house, you know, every day. And like, I'm looking at him saying, you drive, for, and he's an investor, but he drove past that house every day for two years. <laughs> so I think persistence, follow up, having a little bit of a system to, to track your, your leads, that's all super important. But the name of the game is you want to try to get the, the motivated sellers. And, you know, we've been through a couple market cycles, some easier than others, and, and now it's a tough time. Um, so that's where we kind of just kind of bring it back to basics and um, you know even within our own our own office meetings we we go back to, to what has worked over the last 20 years and um, you know like anybody I meet try to leverage us whether it's with our money our experience we'll joint venture um, you know we kind of kind of do it all you know and, and Glenn started that back in I guess you know 1995 and 1998 and we've been able to just kind of roll with it um, Okay, so now, now that they, they all know that I'm the old guy here, okay, that's right. I've been seeing all the cycles, and he was going to say 1970-something, but he was being kind, so, right? so now that we got that out of the way, right, so I try to hang around with all the young guys, um, but what, one, of, one of the ways that I found worked really well um, was, uh, see, back in my day, in order to find deals or do anything, it was, they didn't have, we didn't have the internet, we didn't even have a lot of these meetup groups, it was who you knew, who your dad knew, who your uncle knew. Okay, that was the way we used to get get our deals is by, you know, who who we knew locally, and and I did quite well with that. And uh, we didn't have a lot of competition because I knew people that maybe you didn't know, or Ben's knew people that I didn't know, and it was okay. And then the TV shows came out, right, and everybody became an investor. And then the meetup groups came out, so now you have everybody there. Now it created a lot of competition. But uh, what you could take away from this is. Um, I, I got plenty of deals from going to those meetups and there should be there's really three people that you should talk to when you go to these meetups one is the person running the meetup the second one is the person who has the microphone in front of the room the third one is whoever's standing around like you go if you see Ben's for instance at, at, at a meeting you'll see like five or six seven people around him that's the guy you want to talk to. That's the guy that either has deals, looking for deals, has the money or something. Okay? They're the influencers in, in the room. So I found these meetups were tremendous. Um, and like I said, I, I didn't want competition, so I said, I'm now going to go be the guy with the microphone. So <laughs> I became one of the influencers in the room, and we got a lot of deals. And the last thing is what you know, Paul and I do now is we do a lot of education for investors and real estate agents as well. Why? Why do we do these workshops and seminars? Because the more we can educate someone how to do and know what we know, the, the better and more quality deals we will get. So I, I strongly suggest that you go to these meetings when you see gentlemen like that are up here, even like Jonathan, young Jonathan and his partners, they're doing a tremendous amount of work. Uh, they're the ones you want to talk to. Rub elbows with them. Get to know them. Um, we have a lot of people, a lot of experienced people that are at these meetup groups, which again, we didn't have years ago. So that, to me, it, it was worth a lot. And once I was doing that, I told everybody what I did, and I became the man at the time because, you know, at that time, it, the groups were just starting, and there were a lot of beginners, um, so it worked out really well. And I've seen a lot of people come through the ranks. And I'm just going to use Jonathan as an example because, you know, no offense, but he's probably the youngest one here. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it works for the young and for the uh, mature people. So that's, that's, that, that's what I would say. Network, get out there, let everybody know what you do. Uh, I don't care if you don't have a dime, don't let anybody know it. You just say you have a lot of money, you'll get the money. You get it, okay? Well, thank you, guys. Uh, that's, that's good insight. I appreciate it. Um, just to kick it back to what Paul was talking about, uh, with persistence and consistency, right? We know that that's one of the most important things in this business, right? Because if you don't have that, and you don't have the drive to continue to really go after these deals or even it's not easy right so sometimes you may want to give up but you can't you got to be consistent um so that, that leads to my next question like what would you say is is a good daily routine like how do you 
uh, we just spoke about how you go after these deals, but what's like a good daily routine that you need to keep per, uh, persistent and consistent to actually get these deals? Because you just can't do it one day and think you're gonna get deals, right? It's a it's a routine. It's got to be every day. It's it's repetition. How many times you can get it done? So, what what's your daily routine look like when you're actually hunting for deals? <laughs> so you know. Uh, you know, I'd love to say that it's like a very, very, very active routine, but like one of the things I do, or at least when I got started in real estate, and now even to this day I'm starting to do it again, is that I go to events like these. Mm -hmm. So like uh, when I got started, I went to at my idea was to go to at least one or two meetup events per week, and at that time that was really, really doable. You know, now with COVID, there isn't as many events, but, you know, like for me, I try to do one every two weeks now. And believe it or not, our uh, last uh, meetup event, uh, Nick Tang's meetup event, he, uh, there was, you know, just talking to people, a uh, newer person, he didn't, he didn't know uh, how to get financing for a certain property he had under contract, and now he's wholesaling it to us. Again, just from a simple conversation, you know, like, oh, what do you do in real estate? Do you have anything under contract? You know, and yeah, uh, besides that, I would say um, daily, I, you know, reach out to my sphere of influence. I just post on social media pretty frequently about some of the successes that I have going on, some of the failures, maybe even, because, you know, people don't show that. And then people typically reach out to me because uh, they know that I'm active. Like, you know, I, Right now, I think we have at least like 12 properties that we're actively working on. So, and we're buying six more in the next like six weeks. Yeah. So, overall, it's just showing that you're active and typically people reach out to you about it, you know? Uh, I, don't, I don't know what else to say. It's, you know, like you just show that you're active and that you're looking for deals and deals typically come to you. Like, uh, I, I like I was saying, thirty percent of what we get is from our cold callers, so we're active with the leads as well. So what we do is, you know, we look at them. Okay, what's going on with that one? Have we spoken to them this week? Have we spoken to them this month? Uh, you know, like what's the situation? Okay, you know, like just make sure we call her again next month. Okay, this one, uh, we submitted an offer last week. Let's see what they said. You know, are they interested? Okay, no. All right. Well, keep them on the back burner for the next couple months. Keep asking them every week, you know, like if they're interested or something like that. So it's just all about consistency. And uh, again, it's a numbers game. Like you never, uh, like there's been time, it, it's funny, there, our lake house uh, near Lake Hopakong, um, you know, like, oh yeah, the, the other thing I'd like to say related to that is don't be afraid of putting out offers. Because originally, I think the guy wanted like 350 or something. Uh, Joey, do you remember? It was, it was 350, and like the offer we gave was 250. So at first he was like, "No, never mind. You know, I don't want. You know, you're good. Like, don't worry about it." Like a week or two later, I think it was, he called uh, my partner Joey back. Can you do 275? And then we were like, "Yeah." <laughs> so you know, that's how we bought that property. Um, that's basically it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, to me, all the money is made in the follow-up. Like, it's, it's very rare that you talk to a seller the first time and think that you're going to get a deal. So, we went through all of our deals, um, at any given time from all of our touches, and we touched every client at least between three to five times. Um, you know, some we did get on the first try, some we got on the 10th, right? And they were indecisive. You know, when you're dealing with a lot of uh, pre foreclosures, you have a lot of emotional homeowners who only are looking at you as a shark. Regardless if you're going to help them or not, they're only looking at you like a shark. So you have to really be patient, break it down with them, uh, break it down in terms of what the process is and what you can offer them and what the benefits are from working with you. Um, and in terms of me with my daily routine with follow-up, so with our cold callers, you know, we typically, you know, some days we get no leads, some days we get two or three. So every, every week um, we have a, you know, every week I go through 
where my leads are and, you know, do they need to be touched or not? And then I'm actually following up with them myself or having them follow up if they build a rapport with them to at, at least keep that communication going. Because what I've seen was if you don't, if they don't know a real estate agent and you're the main one that's in their face, then they're probably going to list with you as long as you didn't say anything dumb to, to screw it up for yourself, right? So, um, you know, that's that's what we do daily. Um, and, and other than that, I mean, like I said, I'm constantly, you know, driving around, looking for lots, doing research, pulling tax records, looking at board ups, getting back home, researching it. I don't care what time it is, when I get back, when I can get to it, I get to it. Um, and that's the difference. I mean, you know, a lot of the properties I look up, somebody already purchased it, 2019, 2020, I know most likely, eh, it's probably an investor, they're not gonna be interested. But sometimes I see vacant lots that were bought in like 2009, 2010, those, probably, those people are probably looking to sell. Um, so, you know, I do what I gotta do to track them down. I also go sometimes a little above and beyond and go to the New Jersey, if it is an LLC, I go to the New Jersey State website and see who the owner is of that LLC. And then I skip trace them and call them because you never know if they're in a situation where they may need to sell because, you know, let's be honest, investors get in jams where they could run out of money or they need to unload some stuff. So uh, they're, you know, just every day just looking to create different opportunities. And then obviously, um, like Jonathan said, posting on social, I don't think I do enough of that, but um, just, you know, most of the people that are around me, I would say 95% of the people that are around me know what I do, um, and I'm happy to say that I've done a lot of business with some of my friends, had deals, um, somewhere in the audience right now, so, you know, uh, you know, I, it's just working your sphere and, and being aggressive. Awesome, awesome. Why you pass it up to me? <laughs> <laughs> Again, we all do different things. For me, um, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings. That's my goal. When I do a lot of one-on-one meet, one -on -one meetings, I might meet, let's say, with Chris or with Glenn. Somebody either see me with Glenn, and they reach out to me, and they tell me that they have a deal. Or I met with Jonathan and someone that knows me, or they see my work, the kind of work that I have done, and they will reach out to me. And then um, another thing that I do, anybody that's like in real estate from title to lawyers to, I push myself to have meetings with those people. So I want to know what they're doing, what, what they're doing that I'm not doing. Or anybody that's more successful than me, I definitely want to meet with you to find out what do you have, what's on, what do you have on the table. Maybe you might have a deal that's too small for you. But for me, it might work out. And I continue to been doing that for the last six, seven years by meeting one-on-one -on -one with different people and then getting myself by networking. I'll invest, my, my biggest investment is like into networking. So once I know I'm doing that, I always find deals. It was a time I probably hold like 22 deals to other investors where me, myself, I couldn't fulfill it. I'll do 10, 15 flips a year, but other deals that I was getting, I would sell them to other investors where I'm not the one, the face that's selling the deal. I'll give it to somebody that's a wholesaler, but the deal is actually coming from me. So, but I just got to keep doing the same thing that I've been doing, just being persistent and stay active. Awesome, awesome. And then you guys as being lenders, right, of course. Right. Um, how, what, what kind of advice could you give them as to keep up with consistency? And, and obviously I keep saying you guys are lenders, but I mean, you guys have an extensive portfolio that I know of and what you guys done in the past. You, you guys done some incredible projects and got some good experience so even as investors you can give that knowledge yeah i mean it's a grind right and and you're gonna go through you're gonna go through peaks and valleys according to what the market's giving us um you know i think what you what you said about the follow-up i mean there was a time when there was a lot of reo properties on the market um it was the follow-up for me because we would have an reo that would get listed for 299 say i lived around 210 and it would sit there at 299 and then three months ago everybody comes and sees it when it's 299 and then people start to forget about it and it goes to 289 269 249 and then we see it sell at 220 so for us i remember there was a period of time where we were being very successful with the listed reos letting the letting the agent know whether it was our agent or the listing agent that hey we live around 210 220 and we know it may not take you know a week or two to get there because that was the pattern and the trend we were seeing they were getting overpriced Everybody would show up on day one and look at it at 299. Most of the investors are probably between 200 and 230, 
but maybe f a few fell out because they weren't following up. So I think that the key is in the follow-up, whatever, whatever avenue works for you. Um, early on, we were buying like 70, 75% of our deals from wholesalers. In the last three years, we, we, we have we very minimal with, with the wholesalers. Um, and like I said, we're in an increasing market. Maybe people were willing to speculate more than we were. Um, so the, the trends, I really like to look at the trends and what the, what the macro market is in, in what we're doing because it is going to change. It will loosen up. Um, and, and I think that's, that's also important with, within your, your daily grind. Okay, my daily grind is now I get up and I call Paul and say, what are we, what's going on? Okay? <laughs> so you'll get to that point too. At <laughs> 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 Okay. Anyway, see that's why they had me here to, t to, to make fun of. Okay. But I'm going to give you another, what I think is a great piece of advice. I'm, I'm kind of with Ben's on, on, the, on the meetings and, the, and, and you know, the networking. Um, we we started doing the networking back in 2002. We had our our meetup group, okay, and uh, in fact now that's going on 20 something years. I think the only I saw Chris walk in. I think he's a, probably about 16, 17. It's right around there, right? So it's been 20 years since we've been doing this. So I'm like Ben's. I'm I'm into hey personal contact, getting out there, letting everybody know what what I do. So if I can give you a piece of advice here, I would say. Find something that you like to do, not that you want to do, find something that you like to do and then dominate it, okay? If you don't like door knocking, don't do it because you're not going to be good at it. But someone else that likes doing it, a lot of realtors like doing it, that's great and they're going to get great deals, okay? <laughs> if you like sending out mailers, do it. If you don't, don't. So you got to find that niche that you like. Like Jonathan said, he likes going to the networking groups. He'll do it all right twice a week. Uh, no, not twice a week. He used to try to do it twice a week, every couple of weeks. Okay, so Ben's may have meetings now every day or three times, but he's good at it, and that's how, where he gets his deals from. Same thing we do. So find out what it is that you like to do, dominate it. We dominated the space in the uh, networking. Like I said, it's been over 20 years. And we've gotten tremendous amount of deals, and, and with our lending, we've gotten tremendous amount of uh, borrowers. Of course, we educated them, um, but you know, again, for us, that was the thing. So just find out what you want to do, and and like it. Because if you don't like something, it's like it's like work. If you don't like work, you're not going to be too good at it, right? <laughs> well, you got to pay your bills, it's but passion. you know, it's passion. We all got to love our jobs. It's passion. Yeah. You got to love it, and that's what you'll see the successful real estate agents, uh, well, agents and investors do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that would be my awesome. My Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And you know, just to touch on that, I mean, it's 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 100 true, right? You can't do a million things and expect to be good at it, right? So, like, what you're saying is, find what you feel comfortable with and dominate it, and just be consistent at it, and just bust every door down if that's what you want to do. Or hit every address with a mailer if that's what you want to do. Hit the phones and call number that comes across your plate if that's what you feel comfortable with but you just got to find one thing and really dominate it and that's what's going to get you to to where you want to be um, we know that the market is is saturated right with a lot of new investors right a lot of people want to learn how how to get into the business how to make money right that's why we're all here so the thing is how do we separate ourselves right so what is a good tip that you can give to a new person or even a, or even a veteran investor in the business in today's market right let's we know today's market is different than it's been for the past couple of years so what's the best tip that you can give if you had one tip to give what's the best tip that you can give them to to stand out from the rest to help them get an offer accepted on a deal um i i would probably say the so, like, the first first off, I don't like saying that the market is saturated. Okay. I'm probably doing the most... <laughs> I'm probably doing the most business I've ever done in the past four years. Now, granted, it's because, you know, we formed a partnership and, you know, we work together. And instead of all three of us doing separate things, mm -hmm. now we're all, you know, like, as one uh, unit. But, again, like, just... I, I guess the one tip is you just have to change your mindset. There's deals there. There's a lot of deals that are to be had. Mm -hmm. um, right now with COVID, there is so much, you know, like, un you know, unfortunately for people, there's going to be some, uh, a good amount of pre-foreclosures. So there is opportunity out there. Now, it's not right away. 
but if you start talking to some of these homeowners, you know, like again, the three to five, 10 touches, then they might see you as that person that they may want to sell to or something to that extent. So it's coming where you're going to be able to buy a lot of properties. Now, you know, like you could also always just network, meet with new people. You never know who you meet that could cha alter the face of your entire business. Like one of the first meetups I, I went to, I met Joey and like, again, one of my business partners now, we never, you know, like we didn't like really get anything out of that first meeting, but then, you know, like he reached out about a deal we for we you know we partnered on that deal then we partnered on a couple other deals and you know like at you know but when covid hit we were like this is stupid that we're you know just only doing a deal by deal let's work together on everything and like you know last year i think i did 12 deals total now we've bought in bought like 16 properties already so like it you know it's just crazy how it works awesome man yeah. Yeah, there you go. Um, standing out. So, again, just to um, reiterate what Jonathan said, I, I think it's about just staying the most consistent. Um, I wouldn't wait for foreclosures to start back up. Actually, I'm, I'm not waiting for it. Um, I'm reaching out to homeowners now that you can, you can pull pre-foreclosure lists right now um, and start targeting them now. Right, so I want to be the one that's offering them information, even if I don't get the deal. Right, like my whole thing is to add value to people. I like to create win win situations. If they're going to lose their property anyway, I'm not the reason that they're losing it. Although, when you get on the phone with them, they take it out on you like you are. Right, <laughs> I'm not the reason, but if I can help them get money back, right, save their credit, right, have them, let's be honest, they're milking it. Right? If they're not paying, they're milking it. I can help them. Okay, here's how you're going to milk it. Do you have a date yet? Let's talk about it, right, and figure it out. So I like to add value to them, and then in return, um, I get deals. So um, people usually like that approach because it's not just like, let me buy your house, let me buy your house. you got to move out now. you got to listen, be reserved, and see what their problem is, and then solve it. Um, so that, you know, in terms of, again, in the market, when if you're – buying something on auction or buying something um, through a wholesaler or something. I, I can't tell you that because I don't I don't do those things, but I can tell you that if you are, you either gonna you're gonna have to come with cash and you're gonna have to waive a lot of the contingencies to make it easy for the seller and the seller's agent, whatever that may be. Um, but yeah that that's where I would be. Well for me as a piece of advice for a new investor, try to change your mindset, like they said. Analyze the deals to make sure that the deals make sense. One thing I always do is like I analyze the deal like I'm a hard money lender, like I'm an underwriter. Like basically, not just because it's a deal, or oh, let me go ahead and get the deal. At the end of the day, you might do the deal, and the deal, you don't make no money. There's no profit. So try to understand if you buy it at a certain amount, I mean certain price, after you fix it, you're really going to make money. Or if you become too much of a competition, go somewhere else. This is not the only place that you're going to be able to find a deal. You keep saying, like, it's saturated, 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 because everybody's looking at the same place, because everybody wants one area. That area is making you money. But if you're really an investor, you really want to do, do deals, you can find deals anywhere where deals, the deal will make sense. It's, it's, it's all about the figures. If the numbers make sense, it's going to work. So try to go, try to be... Stay out of your comfort zone. Go somewhere else and then and see how it works out. And then the same deal you might be looking at here, you might be over there f for lesser price, and the number's still the same. And then just keep keep doing it. And then reach out up to other people in, in different areas. And that's my piece of advice. That's it. Awesome. <coughs> Me? Yeah, I forgot what the question was already. <laughs> I'm always the last here. <laughs> Uh, how do you get sellers to accept you offer? How would you do with the seller, right? How's the new agent? If you agents? had a good tip. If you had a good tip, okay. Okay, I got it. What would you give I got them? it. I got it. <laughs> okay. Best tip I can give you is when you're speaking to a seller, and like, I forget who said it. You may have said it. They, they, they look at you as the, the big bad wolf, okay? Um, my advice is to, and I say this when people are buying deals, selling deals, and everything else, disclose everything. Tell them why you're there. You know why you're there. You're there to do what? 
to make money. Money, okay? There's no reason not to let the homeowner know that and right up front say, I'm here to help you because you want to help them. Bottom line is you got to help them. You got to, like you said, figure out what, what their problem is and see if you can solve it. Okay? And then you got to tell them, I'm, he I'm here to help you. Yes, I'm here to make you an offer, but you have to understand. See, sellers don't understand why investors give offers. You know what they call that? Yo, you're going to give me a low ball offer. Right? You're going to steal that. You need to explain to them why your offer is $150,000. Okay? Okay, you got to tell them why. Say, I need to buy this house for 150 because you need, how much work do you need here? And they go, oh, yeah, well, a lot. Yeah, like what? Like 100? Yeah, okay. So that's 250. Okay, I need to sell, this house will probably sell for three and a quarter, 330. After I pay my closing costs and financing costs, and I'm going to be left with about 40 or 50 or 60 thousand dollars. It's going to take me six or seven or eight months to do this. Do you think I'm entitled to make fifty or sixty thousand after eight months, and I'm putting up my own money and I'm borrowing money? Now they're going to sit and go, "Hmm, okay." I, now I see why your offer is one fifty, because trust me, when 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 you give an offer like that, they're going to call their brother-in-law, their out-of-work brother-in-law, and they're going to come over and say, "You're going to you're you're going you're stealing this house, and you're going to make three you know three hundred thousand dollars on this deal." All those investors here have heard that, right? You're going to make three hundred thousand. Okay, all right. Bob, sit down. I'm buying it for 150. I got to put in 100. It's 250. And we're going to sell it for three and change. I'm going to make about $60,000. Or why don't you put in the $250,000 and help your sister out? And then, you know, you don't have to do that. You can do it. So they understand now what you're doing, they understand the numbers. And no one's going to say, hey, after eight months' worth of work, that you're not entitled to make 50 or 60 or $40,000 after you're putting up you know, $200,000. Does that make sense? So just be honest with them. Let them understand it. They'll feel more comfortable and you'll, you know, you'll get closer to making that sale because they understand you're not the big bad wolf investor. You're there, you're a business person, and this is your business, right? When the doctors charge us money, right, they're entitled to it. They make a lot of money, right? They make a lot of money. They went to school. They spent 10 years. They're entitled to make X amount of dollars. Lawyers, same thing. They could save you three to five years, depending on what you did. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I, I think just from a standpoint of if you're brand new, I mean, just like if you're brand new in any business, right? I mean, I would love to, to do knee surgery on Friday. I think it would be the coolest thing, and I'd love to do it. <laughs> but just think about me walking into the hospital and being like, let me do this, right? I think it's the same thing here. So don't discount. Not that you got to go spend a million dollars on education and everything, but be a sponge. And that's why I think real estate agencies, mortgage agencies, meetup groups where you have that camaraderie, that people that are doing it, soak in what they're doing, learn as much as you can. Um, I think when you're starting off, like I said, whether it's anything you're doing, you know, you're going to have to put in the time. And I think um, we all want to get, we all want to make it overnight and, and, I, and we all want to do it. And that should, you know, eventually be your goal. But I think, um, you know, there's a lot of free or um, inexpensive things that you could do when you're first starting out. Um, and, and, you know, you'll pick up little tidbits from everybody because we do a lot of things differently up mm -hmm. here. Uh, but we're all in that same, you know, that real estate space. So I think, um, you know, if, if, if you can't place enough importance on that from, from being a, a, a true newbie coming in and just trying to learn it all, um, you know, whether you're a mortgage broker or a real estate agent, um, you know, definitely don't, um, don't underestimate the, uh, the learning and the education piece of it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we know we do have some realtors in the building, right? And we have some realtors up here that are investors as well or were realtors at one time as well. Um, so I just want to give some insight to that. Right, so right, what, what's the best advice you can give a realtor to l utilize their, their systems and their networks to really land a deal? It's a two-part question. To land a deal, and what kind of advice could you give a realtor as well to help source deals for their investor? As an investor standpoint, what kind of advice could you give them to bring and kind of know how to bring a proper deal to an investor? So two-part question. As a realtor, how can you use your network and your systems to find a good deal for yourself to start in the business? And as a realtor and as an investor, how could you give advice to a realtor to find a proper deal to come to an investor? Well, I mean, realtors are basically doing the same thing that we're doing. The only th difference is they're doing it for a discount, like I, I, in my opinion. Uh, so 
<laughs> like, <laughs> not 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 to be mean or anything, but you know, it is a good thing to have that. Uh, you know, like I guess that card under your sleeve as well, because you know, as a realtor, if they don't want to sell to you, or you know, like they have no problem with putting it on, you know, like buying it or selling it for the highest amount possible, then you know, yeah, you could be an agent and you know, like list it for them. S but you know, like there's a lot of these people that they don't want to list, they don't want to, um, they don't want anyone to see the property, like they, you know, for one reason or another. Uh, so they're just either shy or embarrassed. So as an agent, like, for example, I've told Oscar this, like, you could go door knocking and there's going to be a house that looks dilapidated, but someone, for some reason, they still live there. So you knock on that door and, you know, like, instead of putting on your uh, realtor hat, you know, you say, like, hey, I'm a local investor in the area. I'm looking to invest. Uh, I have an uh, investment property down the block, whatever, uh, and I'm looking to purchase a couple more properties. Do you or anyone else you know in the area, uh, are they looking to sell right now? And then, you know, start from there. Like, if, if you're door knocking. Uh, same thing with uh, if you're cold calling. Like, are you interested uh, in selling your property? In, you know, like, I'm a local investor, rather than saying I'm a local realtor. So, because at the end of the day, some clients, they just want or some, you know, some uh, sellers, they just want to deal with the person that is buying the property. They don't want to deal with a middleman that they think is a shark that, well, not that they don't think investors are sharks too sometimes, <laughs> but they don't want to deal with uh, a realtor they think is a shark just making the 5%, 6% commission for just putting it on the MLS. So, you know, like, uh, again, you just, you know, it's just a different tool in your tool belt. Yes. But how do, once you get the seller and you stated that you are investor in, interested in perhaps in, in that property, so how do you change it that you are actually a realtor that you want to put the house for the, uh, uh, on the list? So I mean, I I would tell so I would tell them that like you know if there's if they say oh I want this much you know i tell them up front like look that's un you know unfortunately i'm not able to purchase at that price because of certain costs associated with the property however if you are comfortable i'm also a realtor and i can help sell your property on the market here is a good here's a rough idea of how much it may sell you know based on the condition it is in right now does that make sense Yeah, I, I yeah, I fully disclose like one of the things I always ask people when they want they come to me, uh, when they want to sell their property is why don't you list it on the market? Why don't you get a realtor? That's one of my first questions typically. Uh, if I'm doing if I'm doing some cold calling or if someone calls me back or something along those lines. Because the thing is it's kinda like a little bit of a reverse psychology that they are talking themselves out of getting a realtor, talking themselves out of putting it on the market. Is that an answer? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, so just to kind of um, piggyback off of what Jonathan said, I think, you know, it's, in terms of agents bringing good deals, you have to know, you have to just study your market. Um, we have access to the MLS, which is, you know, the regular person doesn't, right? So you just need to study it. Out all of my deals, I start from the end and go. I start from the back first, right? So I start like any some any time somebody sends me a deal, I start off. Okay, how much can I sell it for? And I don't just go to the town. I'm actually mapping out where the what's selling in the neighborhood, what's selling around the corner. You you have to dig deep and really know your numbers, right? In terms of the rehab stuff, you, you may or may not know that if you're inexperienced, but you leave that to your investor. 
but at least you know, okay, this is what it can sell for. This is the price point. So maybe let's say if you think something, if they say, uh, you know, if a typical seller says it needs fifty thousand, you can just probably add another fifty thousand to that, right? <laughs> they never, they're always off. So you know, as an agent, you just want to know. Well, damn, okay, I know this house just sold for six hundred. They want three fifty. This could potentially be something, right? Like so. I always start back front and just really study study your market and know your numbers. Like, really map it. Take the time out. Sometimes it takes hours to do it. But, you know, that's where that passion comes. That's where that obsession comes, um, really, you know, really studying your market. In my case, um, most of the realtors I do business with, they probably know more than me. <laughs> and I train them to be exactly like me or even know more than me. So they will go look at a property because they, they really get involved in a day-to-day -day operation of all my flips, everything that I've been doing. In the morning, they will still, oh, I'm going to stop at, at the flip to see what the guys are doing. They will take pictures. So after a while, like, you know, they become friends. They become families. I will sit down with them like, okay, this is how much money that I'm spending on it. This is the work. How much the HVAC costs? I basically go into details of everything that I'm doing. Like most of the realtors that I do business with, probably been doing business for the six, seven, eight years, they typically just like me. There's, there's no difference. So they will know whether to bring me a deal or not. Or sometimes they would say like, well, you know, I found a deal, but I don't think it's going to make sense. I would say like, all right, give me the numbers. And I, same thing, just to piggyback, like Glenn said, I, I, they would analyze the deal the same way. They would say, okay, this is what the ARV is. Let's do that times 65. This is how much money we're going to spend. This is what it is. And we try to be conservative. So it's for me more education with all my realtors. And my realtors, they're not just there to convince me to do a deal so they could make a commission. They're there to basically. My success is their success. If I win, they win. So that's how it is for me, though. Yeah, I mean, I'm not an agent, but I do deal with a lot of agents. And I think. Um, just to, to kind of talk about what John said, I think a, a lot of the houses that we have bought that have been the, you know, hoarder houses with stuff all in it, the homeowners don't even want to list that because, like I said, they may have, uh, you know, an embarrassment or they, so it almost takes putting that on the market off the table, right? So they may, they may not push in that direction. Now, on the flip side, if it's like just grandma's house and whatever, they may overlist it by 100000 because they think everybody on the street selling for four seventy five. So, you know, it, it, you really need to read that seller on what, what, their, what their hot button is or what it is. But if you have, um, you know, a seller that it's a hoarder house and it needs work and they're saying, well, you know what, no thank you, agent. I don't want to put this house on the market. You can almost know what's going through their mind. They don't want everybody in the neighborhood truck. That's where I think an agent that, that understands the investment area and whatever could say, okay, listen, like kind of like Glenn and, and Ben said, um, you know, somebody can buy this house cash. And you may be able to leave all your stuff in here. And they may not even know that could be an opportunity. We've bought stuff with two, three, four dumpsters worth. So there, there are some hot buttons that these sellers, um, you know, it may be off their shoulder because they say, before I list this house, what's an agent going to say? You got to open up this whole house. You got to get empty. So a lot of agents sometimes pass on those houses. They don't even want to deal with those houses. Um, so I think from, from that standpoint, knowing your seller and, and, and trying to, to bring the value of, hey, you know, it's okay. I'm not here to list your house, but you know, I do have a, a couple cash buying investors that could, that could pay for it as is. <clears throat> I think sometimes that angle with houses that are, you know, deeply distressed and, and packed, a lot of times the homeowners don't want to list them, which you'll be surprised. Um, and, and sometimes from an investment standpoint, we've gotten decent deals from that type of, you know, scenario where the agent was like, hey, you know, I have a, a property over here. You know, it's got to be all cash and you got to take it with, with everything in it. Awesome. Not to give away all the gyms, but that's actually how we approach a lot of our sellers. Like we don't, you don't have to have anybody come into the property. Um, if you've been spending money on your house, stop it right now. And everybody <laughs> likes to hear that. Every every time I say it, they love hearing that. Um, and then you know, we just talk about how you know you don't you're not going to have to pay anything for you know for working with us. It comes from the bank and things like that. But yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now that you guys gave some good insight and some good tips. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Let's go. Oh, one question. Oh, no. They left them out. No, that's okay. It's okay. I forgot the question. Go ahead. You remember. 
no, no, I'm not the agent. It's got to be like, it has to be like, um, uh, what's the show with the, what's his name? No. <laughs> no Steve Harvey. Ah. Steve Harvey. What? Uh, family Feud? Family Feud. Family feud. Ah. You know how he goes and he repeats the question every ah. time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what we were asking is, you know, there's a lot of realtors in, in the building, right? So we were asking, like, what's the best way as a, as a realtor to uh, help our realtors find a good deal for their investor, right? And them, as a realtor, find a good deal for themselves to get started in the investment world. I knew that. I'll be quick. Okay. Number one, one of the, one of the things I think uh, realtors should do, because they have access to the MLS, um, is to, I'll just give you one, is how about all those expired listings and all? Okay. You may have heard about it and all, but you know how many realtors don't, once that listing is expired, that's a done deal. Okay, that just goes away. You know what? In two months or three months, that could be one of your best motivated sellers. So I would just kind of keep in contact. And you can do that as a realtor as well. You know, you could be in contact with sellers after, you know, after, the, ex uh, uh, after the listing expired. Okay? So, you know, just like Paul said before, it's a, it's a follow-up. Okay, that's a, to me, that's a, that's a great avenue over there. And as far as bringing deals to the investors, uh, like Ben said too, know what we know. Okay? Know the numbers. Know the formulas. Know what a good deal is because, and I love real estate agents, by the way, okay? I'm one, I think. I'm <laughs> one, I got my license so long ago, it's like dust on it, okay? <laughs> so, um, but know what we know. Learn how to, to do the formulas, like Ben said, whether it's 70%, 60%. You might not be familiar with those terms right now. But say, know what a deal is. So when you bring it, it's like all teed up for us. Give us all the information on the property. Okay, let us know about the neighborhood if, if we're not familiar with it. Okay, so I would just say know those numbers, learn it well, know what we know, and you'll you'll bring quality deals. I got one last thing I want to say. One of us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm sure anyone here on the panel, like if you guys are looking to, you know, learn how to buy some of these properties, uh, you know, if you find a homeowner that doesn't want to list, we, n anyone here would be more than happy to go step by step on how we, why we would submit this type of offer, um, how we're going to get the financing, and then heck, maybe even help you list the property for us, uh, and also show you step by step everything that we're doing in the renovation. Like, oh, why are we adding a bathroom? Why aren't we adding a bathroom because of this market? Or so any any other little detail that you know, you could see. Like, I know Oscar, when he li uh, listed one of our properties in Roselle, uh, like, we really didn't do too much based off the market. And then, like, he came, he came back to us during the inspection period, like, these guys have a list of items. And Joey, Mark, and I were like, instead of, d like, going through the I list, we're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and Oscar, to his amazement, like, I think we basically all of it, no, we didn't do any of it, so, you know, but that's because it's this market. Mm -hmm. Correct. Jonathan, thank you for uh, uh, you know, doing the next Zoom meeting. Uh, uh, like, you're going to do a Zoom on that. I think that'll be great. <laughs> 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 you just raise your hand on the next Zoom. I think you're going to sit down. Awesome, four. awesome. Uh, and, and just to touch on it a lot, too, like, you know, these guys are active buyers in today's market nonstop. So if anybody out there has a deal, they is good. I mean, before you leave, get their numbers. They're here. They're active. They're ready to buy. So you got buyers right in front of you for your deals. Even if it's your first transaction, third, fourth, fifth, whatever, it doesn't matter. These guys can become uh, a good client of yours. So keep that in mind before you leave. Um, now that we touched on a lot of that stuff and, and you know, give us some good tips and, and tools to the belt for everybody that wants to learn, um, we want to get to the juicy stuff, right? We want to know... Um, in, in your entire career, right? How did you land your best deal in your career to date? So from your entire career, what would you say? Give us the best example of your first deal. I mean, your best deal. Um, how did you acquire it? What did you do to sell it? How you sold it? And of course, how much did you make? We want to inspire. Uh, I let these guys go first while I think about it because there's plenty of deals where we've made a good <laughs> amount of money, but then there's also deals where we made decent amount and I did absolutely nothing. Uh, so I don't know. That, that, I mean, that, that works. That works. I get. I guess I'll start first. So I, I actually got two, and it's it's very hard for me to to pick. Um, 
So okay. the first one came from, um, they were all short, both short sales, but the first one came from a homeowner, which we cold called, and she actually signed with us, and like a lot of these sellers do, she went missing, and she just went ghost. And we needed documents. If you're familiar with short sales, um, there's a lot of docu uh, documentation that you need in order to continue to get the deal done. And for whatever reason, I don't know if somebody else got in our head, because that happens a lot. People knock on the door like, oh, he's only giving you this. I'll give you that. And then they get missing. So regardless, five months, seven months go by. Don't hear from this lady. Um, I'm like, you know what? Now, mind you, we were calling her throughout the whole time, but then we fell back a little bit because we were like, all right, at this point, we're just stalking her. She's not picking up, right? Um, so then seven months went by, reached out to her. She picked up. Whatever the case was, I caught her on a great day. She's like, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. This happened, that happened. I'm ready to move forward. I'm like, yes. So go back, <laughs> submit the deal at like 50000 And now, mind you, this, this, the house needed work. It was, where, where, where it? It, was on, it was on Ocean in Jersey City, okay. on Ocean App. And I submitted at 50000 Now, for whatever reason, uh, I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with SPS. Let me not. This being recorded, right? Like, so <laughs> I loved SPS. Both of my, both, both of my best, best deals came from SPS. So we submitted it within 15 to 20 days. We had an approval for fifty grand. Now, mind you, she was able to get relocation for 10000 they paid there were judgments they paid everything the net to them was like 13 grand and i couldn't believe that they approved it but i'm like this is amazing and it was another lien that we have to end up getting approved but i was able to wholesale that without touching it and make 200 grand so that was my that was my best deal um where i absolutely did nothing and then um, well, it was a lot of work to get to that point. It wasn't nothing, but well, I didn't yeah. have to actually work on it. Get it right? the consistency. Yeah, the consistency, just, just being consistent and just staying on top quick. of it. No, 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 no. Yeah, and a, a lot of my deals, um, because I've worked on a lot of short sales, I'm in my deals for like two years sometimes uh, from the time that we initially make contact with the homeowner to processing the short sale. Sometimes that takes long to closing on it, to rehabbing it. So <laughs> I'm... You know, these houses, I got stories for days. But the second one, similar, we cold called it. Um, this guy, this was a house in Newark, um, in Ironbound, and the house was just sitting there vacant forever. And I'm surprised nobody else got to it. Again, it was SPS. I submitted the offer at 40 grand, and it took, this one took a long time. And I'm just working it, working it, working it. And finally, they approved it. Man, oh man. I. Put in now, mind you, it was a two fence small house, forty grand. I put like maybe a buck and a quarter into it. I sold it for three ninety nine. So I netted like around, uh, I netted like around two, like around two hundred. And that was those were my two best deals. But again, um, yeah, both came from cold calling and just being persistent. Awesome. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> SPS. So SPS is a servicing company. Um, at the time, I don't know where they were at now because I haven't done anything with them really recent. But is that again? No. So the, yeah, they service. So so there are the lenders hire servicing companies when a lot of people go into default because they don't have the capacity to do the follow up and and do all the negotiations of people that are either need to do loan modifications or short sales. So they hire a servicing company, which is a third party, to come in and kind of be like the middleman, so to speak, um, to, you know, handle those type of um, those type of loans that are in default. Um, and SPS just happened to be one of the great ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, um, one deal I had got in Newark, that was one of the deals that, you know, I made good money on it and I can't be like him just because I made 200 but it was one of the deals that somebody called me and basically um, let me know that their aunt was losing a house and basically that they know the bank that has it. So in order for me to contact the bank, the girl actually asked me to give her $5,000 so she could give me the phone number so I could call the bank. So again, <laughs> nevertheless... <laughs> You know what? I said, you know what? I'll give her the five thousand dollars. She gave me the five. I paid her the five thousand dollars. She gave me the lender. I called the lender myself, 
and I spoke to the lender. So the lender happened to be, they bought the mortgage note. They wasn't the one that actually who had it. So they probably paid 10 cents on a dollar or whatever, whatever the case was. So they didn't pay a lot of money for it. So I came in and I basically offered them that I'm giving them $80,000 for it because knowing a little bit inside source of our, like when somebody buy the mortgage note, this is what's happening. So at the time, they were kind of like freak out because the, the homeowner had already told them that they, they was, she was going to file for bankruptcy. They know once the homeowner file for bankruptcy, they don't, they're going to gonna take them for a ride at least another five to six years. So they were able to take the 80000 so I paid the lady $5,000. And after that, I had to meet the homeowner itself and I offered them cash for keys, which I offered them $10,000. After they moved, I probably put in maybe 10, 15 grand to clean up the property. And then within 30 days, I got the biggest offer in my life. And then thanks God that I invested that $5,000. That was the best deal. <laughs> That's it. That's awesome. <laughs> Let's hear it. I know you got something good for us. I know it. Um, okay, maybe, but how about, <clears throat> A, a good deal that you could all relate to better better than yeah. the biggest deal okay <laughs> um, and this goes back to working you know looking for motivated sellers and all uh, I went to look at a property and it just so happened Paul my other son happened to be there the we, we, we went to look at a property um, the, the fellow had passed away and his, his, his daughter and son were there so we went to meet, and they were asking like two hundred and something thousand dollars for the property, two twenty-five or two fifty. And we said, "There's no way this is worth two twenty-five or two fifty. Uh, so let's just go in and look. So we went inside. We looked at the house. It was in horrible shape. But the the son and the daughter were outside. It had to be like ninety-eight degrees. They were outside cutting the grass, right? And so we said, "You know, can we go in and take a look?" And they spitting grass out of the <laughs> mouth. And they said, so, "Yeah, go ahead, go in. We're cutting here." So we go in. She goes, "It's horrible." I say, "Okay, we got to make an offer." I said, why don't we offer like, you know, 200,000 and you know, we put some money into so we could probably make a good deal here. So the two boys say, well, why don't you like offer like 150? I said, I don't know. I think, I don't know. I thought 200 would be a good offer. He said, well, you could always, you could always come up. You can't, this is like the young teacher of the old now, right? I said, okay. But nah, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't feel right. I'm going to, I'm going to offer him 200,000. They go, oh, okay, but you know, you could always come up. So we went outside. I said, oh, can, can I just talk to you now? I said, okay. They come over, <laughs> spitting grass out and everything. <laughs> it was a hot day. It was all sticking to their skin. So I go, you know, the house needs some work and everything, and you're asking this kind of money, but we'd be prepared to offer you cash, and we can close very quickly. We can get you out of this, and I'll give you $250,000. <laughs> i never forget. The girl looked up, went, the lady... I think we'll take it, you know, <laughs> if we can get us out quick. <laughs> Turned around and sold the property for 300, three and a quarter, it was, nice. right? 325000 the next week. In a week. In a week. In a the week. property was worth that, okay? <laughs> so the, the point to that is, you know, it's the motivation. They were motivated. They were going to split that 150000 and they didn't want anything to do with the property. So again, go with the motivation. And just to digress real quick, when you, we were talking, I know we're lenders, we haven't really talked about the money aspect, right? We're talking as investors, but for your real estate agents, when you're speaking with the seller, whether it's, you know, you, whether you're gonna uh, buy it for your investor or it's for yourself, just make sure they understand that money is not the issue. When they ask you how you're paying for this, you just tell them, we're gonna pay you cash. Okay, I don't care if it's 100000 or 300000 This is why when you know what we know, any one of us would buy it, you have the cash because we all have the cash to buy it. And if you want it for yourself, then you'll go to a lender like us, okay, and we would give you that cash. So never let that be a factor and never let them even get a whiff that you don't have the money or you have to uh, depend on getting financing because that's that will stop the door right there. Or they'll, they'll talk to somebody else who comes to the door. So. We'll find the money. You always have the money. So if, if you have to buy a house, property, I can come to you. excuse me. Yes. If I want to buy a house, I can come to you, and you will be my lender. If it's good, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm first. We're gonna analyze it and tell you if you have a deal. Okay. Yeah. Money is not the <laughs> money is not the issue. If you have to buy that, here's a house around the corner. Here, you could buy it for two hundred thousand. Can you close on it next week? <laughs> That's the answer. 
<laughs> that's the answer. A lot of times we'll ask. A lot of times we'll ask people, "Can you buy the?" F no, I don't have it. Yes, you do. You'll yes, you do. No excuses. No excuses. There's too many cash. Buyers around. Goodness, I can come to you. <laughs> Yeah. You can come to us. <laughs> it's, it's a yes. Degree here. He's, he's very <laughs> while, it, while it lasts. <laughs> yes. I, I, I actually, I actually got a deal I could mention with with you guys. Oh, uh, recently. Just b oh, b before you get in that, just want to say, uh, since this is being recorded, those uh, those numbers, they were. Uh, I also had some expenses for this, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just throwing that out there. There were some expenses. Uh, <laughs> so, my deal, there was an $80,000 tax lien I had to pay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know, back with uh, Glenn and Paul. They actually financed one of the deals we had recently uh, in Elizabeth. We bought it for one fifty, or sorry, 167 from a wholesaler. Literally, the day of closing... Or no, the day before closing, we got someone to cut the grass. Uh, the day of closing, we had the stager set it up. And then, like, by that weekend, it was listed. Uh, now, based off the market, we sold it for 275 Now, after all expenses and everything like that, we made about 70 ish K off of, like, two months of work. And it was literally just calling a stager. The red book? <laughs> the house of the red book? Yeah. Yeah, the one, the one that you were, I, I think someone was like, yeah, nothing's changed. Yeah. Yeah. Are you nine good? Yeah. I was at yeah, the yeah, house. Yeah, yeah. I was at the house. <laughs> you step out, you want that, you open the door, you two steps down, you get hit by a truck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's funny. So. Well, this, this, this is good deals too. Like, oh. you know, like yeah. me on wholesale deals, I have sold wholesale deals in Mawa, you know, not even doing anything. I just had it under contract with auction.com. I put it. I put it out there, a wholesaler reach out. We, there was three of us who were partner. I know we made over six figures on it. Right. Right. Nice. Wholesale deal, we didn't even do nothing. We didn't even clean it. Is that why you always dress so shit? Yeah, yeah. I got a network. I got a network. <laughs> and I, I, Glenn just made me depressed because I was on a very low commission split back when I was 23 <laughs> on that deal. But, um, you know, aside from the properties that we purchased from wholesalers, the one that stuck out to me was through a mailer. Uh, remember, we used to buy the envelopes in yellow, green, and whatever. You think they're getting invited to a party. Right. So I get the call. I get the call, and I go there for the first interview. And it was, um, I think it was in Wallington or Lodi, and it was a hoarder house, cats, Marlboro Reds, everything. So I'm, I'm sitting down speaking to the seller, and I'm, I look to the right, and I see a, a shoebox full of letters. And I'm like, holy cow, like a shoebox full of letters. We buy houses, all this stuff. So I had the first meeting with her, and, and you know, she wasn't ready, right? She wasn't motivated at that point. Um, did the follow-up, did, did, did everything like that. Finally got my second meeting with her. So I show up with a carton of Marlboro Reds and a, and a tourist book of, for Arizona because she said she wanted to go to Arizona for her sister, and she said, I'm ready to go. And I said, that's great. She's like, but I want to go Monday. And I'm like, wait, Monday? We got to sign the contract. We got to agree on whatever. So we wound up making the deal with her, but what she really wanted to was to be on a plane on Monday. <laughs> so remember, we got the plane ticket. We, we fronted the plane ticket. We fronted the car service. We agreed, we, we agreed on a price. Um, and... You know, f when you buy a deal from a wholesaler, right, they do all the hard work. But that was one where... He was walking to the limo with the money, right? And to open the door. Right, yeah. And close the door. And, and, and I said, listen, we're going to close. Once title comes back, your attorney's going to wire you the money in Arizona. But she literally, I think it was like we met on like a Wednesday or Thursday, and she was on a plane on Monday, l left everything in the house, you know, it inherited. It was just a, a, real, a real hoarder house. So from a standpoint of going through the, the marketing and setting up the... The, um, the interview, and I think going back to what Chris said, when I saw that pile of things, just think, you're not the only person like trying to, to sell or whatever, so to me it was like how do you stand out? It was like, was that little Arizona book about tourist things, or was it the Marble Reds? It was Reds? the Marble Reds, yeah. Or was it, was it, was it something? Because remember, she probably had 15 people sitting in the same spot saying, sell me your house, I want to buy it, so standing out i think is you know what you could do and being empathetic and and right everybody you're, it's a competitive space if it, and, and it's not easy so i think for me that was a, a good one i mean i don't think i made a tremendous amount of money and then after i had to give him his cut it was probably even probably even less <laughs> <laughs>
just one thing that for all of you, and I, and I know I, I, I think I speak for all the investors here. Um, some of the stories are funny, uh, but always remember you're dealing with people. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, don't don't steal their houses. Try to make good deals. Uh, help them. Get them the plane ticket, and that's worth more to them than you know another five or ten thousand dollars probably is to help them out. So, you know, have compassion. You know, people get in trouble. That's just what life is about. Um, our stories, you know, we tend to make them a little bit funny, but um, I, I don't think we ever, or, you know, take to, uh, take advantage of people. Okay, so it's a business. You're there to make money. Do it fair. Disclose what you're doing. Make a lot of money, and you're okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. And and just to add on to that, I mean, with pre foreclosures, a lot of times, right? Like homeowners are going to lose the property if you don't get involved if you don't get involved they're they're going to be in a worse situation so just if you lead with the intent to help them solve the problem then you will you will get the listing and you will make money but you just got to keep that in mind right because sometimes you get into you get into um a deal and you don't know the bank may come and they and may, they may appraise it for a hundred grand more than what your offer was right and that happens a lot so you got to be prepared to not make money right we didn't get into that you didn't ask those are juicy too when you lose on a deal or don't make what you expected when things go left um but you always got to just leave with intent and it may just be a listing it may not be a deal right but you know as long as you look at what the best case scenario is for the home we'll win. i actually do have one best and worst deal well worst and best deal and i made no money on both of them oh wow i'll explain why so the worst deal i ever had to deal with is uh when i was getting started in real estate Unfortunately, my parents were losing their house. They hadn't paid their mortgage in pretty much about a decade. Uh, so <laughs> they owed a lot of money. And my dad was just stubborn, like, oh, no, I'm going to be able to get the loan mod. I'm going to be able to get the loan mod. And the like, I think the week of uh, the sheriff's sale date where they were supposed to be kicked out or whatever, finally he listened to me. And then he... Uh, he worked with another uh, gentleman, Matt Miranoff, to do the short sale. And then we, you know, finally short sold the property. Uh, that was probably the the worst uh, day for my mom. Sorry. Uh, you know, because, like, I saw her cry about losing her house still. But the best thing, two years later, same Matt, uh, his assistant Leah called me about a house they had in Belleville that... Like, for some reason, a short sale wasn't working because the price was too high, but they wanted me to check it out. So I went to check it out, and I knew around that time my mom and dad were looking for a house. Well, you know, just so happened I look at the house. It was a two-bed, one-bath. could be converted to a three-bed, two-bath when they want to, uh, and that it, it made sense to them. So as of last year, they, you know, they bought their house uh, with a VA loan. At a much, you know, much cheaper than what they were paying in their uh, previous home, and now they live, fortunately and unfortunately, two houses away from me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that that was probably the best deal I've ever I've ever done. Awesome, awesome. That's great. That's great. <clears throat> you know, so I hope a lot of these tips that these guys gave us today. Could really help because you know the business is there the the inventory is available the the seminars the meetups the educational uh workshops that you can go to they're all there you got to take advantage of that stuff you know you really have to um i mean i, I know a lot of guys that uh, and and women as well because there's a lot of female investors that i know personally too that are actually killing the market in today's market as well um but there's a lot of guys that i've met um from the beginning and i watched them grow uh even then i've been an investor I've been in the real estate investment business for over 11 years. That's how I started my business before I even got into the traditional side of real estate. I started off by doing, you know, mostly the the urban redevelopment areas, right? The areas where a lot of people didn't really want to touch, right? Because those deals were available. So we went and we took advantage of them, and we we, we did well. We did very well. Um, and along the way, I met a lot of good people. Um, but I, I got to see a lot of stories, a lot of su uh, success. A lot of people go through success, drop down, and then get back to it again. Um, but, you know, actually, th there's one person in this building today uh, that I know. He's young. Uh, Matt, stand up. 
So Matt himself, give him a round of applause. No idea Matt was coming today at all. I've known Matt for a couple of years. He's super successful in the business. Um, I watched him grow. He, we sold him site and I sold him a property. Um, north, uh, north Newark. Three families on the corner. He sold me one. North Newark, right? So the property in North Newark, and I bought. Uh, that was the kickoff to his investment of buying doors. How many doors do you own today? Almost 70. Wow. 70 doors. Wow. We sold him his first investment. That's crazy. So besides that, besides that, Matt's been doing a lot of luxury, uh, new construction, residential in the, in the Essex County market. Killing it. He's doing great, man. Not a round of applause. Thanks Thank for supporting him. You gotta go out there, find that first deal, make it work for yourself, and con and just continue flipping the money. Take that that house. You know, th there's different methods to it. We didn't really touch all the different methods, but you know, you have these these great lenders here. Definitely get their numbers today before you leave. They'll help you get started in the business. Um, you know, they're 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 coaches as well, so they'll they'll help you no matter. And then we're here too, right? We're, we're a real estate company, Lifestyle International Realty. We can help you guys buy property. We'll show you how to go. We'll help you along the entire way. And if anybody wants to become a realtor as well, let us know. We'll get you signed up and going. And, you know, I want to, before we leave or anything, I really want to open up for some questions if you guys are okay. Uh, some questions. Go ahead. I just have a question. In situations where the private lender doesn't want to fund the deal, but you guys still think it's doable to buy, how you fund the deal? Uh, besides, you know, people lending you money, how you structure that? If you have three people that have enough money to give you, uh, how much did you pay them back? And how many, how long terms and everything? Because you know, there's a scenario a private lender based on the LTV, based on all their situations, they don't want to fund the deal, but you still think it's doable. How you guys fund it? Or basically, why you guys reject a deal that you think makes sense, but you're still risky to, to fund the deal? So, uh, for uh, private okay. how you how you fund the deal from people that you know if the private lender doesn't want to give it to you and based on what they don't fund the deal um, that doesn't make quote unquote sense right so um, it's a good question so I've as of recent I've had to get really creative um, not really people not funding my deals but just having money to close just because I had a lot of money out in the street working on con projects and things like that so there's a few different ways one if you have again I, I have properties so sometimes I'll leverage properties that I have to get stuff that, that I know have equity in it so I'll have one of my lenders uh, actually I think you may have left uh, oh there he is <laughs> right there um, <laughs> Jeff, my main guy. We we've, we've done a lot of deals together. I may he he may tell me to put a lien on another property that I have, right? And you know, so now I have a lien on this property that I have equity in, and then now that's used as my down payment to source this new deal that I'm looking to um, that I'm looking to purchase, right? So I've done it like that. And as far as rates go, it all depends, right? Money um, money is very saturated in the market right now. But again, it depends on when you need it, how fast you need it, um, and you know what the how long you're gonna have it for, right? So those rates can vary from eight percent all the way up to fifteen percent, right? If somebody's funding hundred percent of the deal, best believe they're gonna charge you a lot more than somebody who's making you put down twenty percent or you know fifteen percent. So you have to just know the market, reach out to a lot of reach out to a lot of different lenders and just shop around and see. You know, some lenders even in today's day and age, they charge you on the full amount of your construction drawer, which I think is ridiculous, but some of them do it. And you wanna make sure you're shopping around to get the best situation um, for yourself. So yeah, no, I think, uh, like you said, I always like to say compare apples with apples, right? Because everybody's situation is different. So you may pay more for money in certain situations than in other. I think what you were saying, though, is if the private lender, you mean like like an uncle, friends, three people? Yeah, because I have a situation where people, I know they do private events to fund deals. Right. So, um, I mean, I, you have done multiple times, I think, right? Yeah, so, so, I mean, let's say I understand the equity part of it. You can take your know, money from my wife. Yeah, right. So if you have zero money and let's say you find a deal and the private lenders sometimes they want to require some history, right? That you have flip houses, whatever they get. The track record. Uh, yeah, yeah track record. So where will you, let's say the deal is so sweet, 
how you fund the deal. You don't want to lose it. Besides, um, okay. I, I, go ahead. I, 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 I could probably be more specific. So when I got started in real estate, I literally had zero dollars. Like, you know, I lived with my parents at the time. So, like, and I was a full-time college student. So literally, all, all I had was time, really. So what I did was, again, go to one of these, like I went to an event a week for a purpose, because I was able to meet at least one or two people every week, and then I stayed in contact with them at the time. Then when I finally found a deal, and I was like, oh crap, I need financing. So I went to a couple lenders, and most of those lenders, because I didn't have great credit either, uh, they were like, oh, you need a partner. So I went to those hard money lenders and, uh, you know, like, now I had to find a partner. So I asked literally over 100 people uh, about this deal, and I knew that it would work. And it, two week, maybe two weeks, three weeks before closing, finally someone said yes. And then luckily they were able to finance the whole thing. So I didn't even need a hard money lender. And, you know, we, at the time, they were charging 14 and four. <laughs> So that, that was actually pretty normal back then, like four, like four years ago or so. So that, what that means is they were charging four points or 4% of the loan uh, up front and 14% interest for the year. Luckily, I was able to get in and out within four months. But yeah, like that's how I got started. Um, nowadays, what I do is usually I go to you know, either Peak or Alpha uh, with the deal. And, you know, they tell me based off the deal what they could give us. And then that, like, 10% down plus holding costs plus closing costs plus points plus uh, construction drawback. Uh, I, rough, you know, I make a rough number and I go to friends, family, other real estate investors. Like, look, I'm going to need 60 k for a year. And, you know, like, I, you know, I don't want to disclose specific numbers, but, you know, I give a certain interest rate. So... Uh, at that point, then I show my track record. Now, if you don't have the track record, I would say partner with someone who has the track record. Because then, you know, you might be giving up 50%, you know, even 75% of, you know, like, or, or close to 90% of the deal. But now you have that, you know, like, yes, I closed this property, I've done this. So then you could leverage that to do more. Like, most of my deals when I got started, like, I was, yeah, like, either... 50 with the lender or like 60 40 or even 70 30 and I really didn't care like it wasn't about the money like it was more about getting that track record because that's what worth way more than what uh you know like you know, you know the ability to do more deals more than money <laughs> track record just mean more than money yeah finding a good lender to jv with is very important as well right when you started would you say like and you guys do a lot of jvs um, with new investors. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. And and like I, I say too, like, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18%, that's like a soft partner compared to 50, 50. So it's all relatively speaking, right? I could go 50, 50 with you and I could also lend to you and charge you 16%. 16% is a soft partner and you're doing better. Mm -hmm. But somebody across the room says 16%, Paul's out of his mind. <laughs> So that's what I mean when I say apples to apples. That's all, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to structure it. And, um, but that's like a great example. Um, you know, I'll go 50, 50 with, with John all day long. <laughs> he's probably, he's telling me, yeah, no, but, but that's like a good example of, of if somebody, yeah, not anymore, but, but, but right, right. And as you get more experience, right now, you're going to have more leverage with the hard money lender because of the private money lender by saying, Hey, I've done five properties or I could put down this much or I could get the project done getting the project done is the execution risk of actually completing an $80,000 rehab that's you know a portion of the risk that we price in I don't know if you want to yeah no I mean uh, and, and don't forget there are lenders and there's lenders there's your hard money lenders that have certain criteria um, they're institu institutionally backed and they have certain criteria that they need to get when you go to a private lender whether it's yourself or someone like us, we're true private lenders because it's our funds and our, and, our, and our friends and family's funds, so we can, you know, do what we want. But you need to compare that. You can't just say, 
okay, what's your rate? And when we go to conferences, it's like, you know, there's 100 lenders there, right? What's your rate? Hi, what's your rate? Hi, what's your rate? Okay, it, it, it all depends on what your situation is. Like, if we give her a, a rate, eight, nine, 10% or 11%, say, right? And say, well, you know, I'm getting, they, they said I can get it at 10% and no points. Okay, your credit's 850, you did 10 jobs, you did this, you did that. Yeah, you can go shop that. But, you know, when you go to someone and we say, okay, you know, what's your credit? Uh, 112, okay, fine. Uh, uh, have you done any? <laughs> this, that's how this bu my, our business was founded upon, uh, founded by working with investors, newbies, which we still do today, beginners, people that don't have good credit. You know, things happen in life, right? It doesn't mean you're a, a bad person or anything. Things happen, okay? Credit gets dinged, okay? We're true asset based. We look at the asset. Is the deal a deal? If it's a deal, we'll get you through the rest. I don't care about the 112. As long as your IQ is above 112, I don't care. The, the, the red credit rate is 112, and if you don't have the finances behind you and everything else, we as private lenders can make that decision to, to work with you, and that's what we do. And that's how the business actually started, by uh, us lending to beginning, inexperienced lender, uh, borrowers. Because we're not, and this is n no offense against the hard money lenders. They're lenders, they're bankers, they're finance people, extremely smart, okay? But we're, we're boots on the ground investors that know where you're gonna get into trouble, and if you get into trouble, we're gonna help you, and we're not gonna go after your assets, okay? We don't, we don't wanna do that. But as, again, in fairness to, to you know, uh, national lenders, you know, they're doing thousands and thousands of loans. That's what they have to do, okay? So we're primarily in Jersey. We do some Florida and some New York. We're primarily here so we can keep an eye on it. So we can keep an eye on for the big, especially for the beginning investors. The more seasoned investors, sometimes investors want more leverage. Sometimes they don't. They'll say, I, I'd rather pay a percent more, or I'd rather pay on, you know, all the money, whatever it is, but I can't make t payments for six months, or, you know, I don't have any finance, I don't have reserves behind me, okay? So, as, as private lenders, we could say, fine, you want to pay an extra percent for that, or whatever? Oh, I'll pay two percent. No, no, it's okay, one percent is fine. <laughs> so, again, what Paul is saying, just compare apples with apples, okay? You want, you want that nine and one and ten and two? You could, we'll give you that all day long, we'll, you know, whatever, whatever the lowest rate is. All lenders can do that. But when you want to start getting flexible, um, especially with even with seasoned investors, they have, they have you know, they have, I mean, Joey and, and, and Jonathan and Mark, they have, I don't know, maybe three or four with us, maybe four others with someone else, okay? They have eight projects. You know, monthly payments on that can be extremely expensive. It's cash draw, you know, that, that's pulling your cash out. So a lot of times, people might say, listen, if I don't have to make payments for six months, you know, I'd rather pay that extra thousand bucks or that extra point or that extra, again, it depends Sorry, uh, on your situation. Yeah. No, no, I'm just saying it depends on your situation. I'm just serious. No, no. <laughs> so what Paul's saying, just compare, yeah, yeah. compare. Right. Don't just say, well, this guy is at this and this is at this, okay? so. And, and, and with the influx of money and, and, and the space getting, you know, there's a lot. Like, if you have a sweet deal, a real sweet deal, you should be able to get it done. You should be able to find somebody to help you and say, hey, this is where you should struggle. What you should be paying out. Obviously, you want to try to pay out as little as you possibly can. Um, you know, where we, where we excel is the speed. If we like the deal, we can close. And when we say we're going to close, we're going to close. If I can't do the deal, I'm going to tell you I can't do it or whatever. But I think a, a private lender should be one of the tools in your tool belt, along with a couple other hard money lenders or, you know, friends or family or local associates that you'll meet throughout your career. And um, and, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to constantly evolve. But like I said, I like to, I like to kind of think we're local here. And we're able to do the things that we do because we're local. You know, we're not lending in, in, in Texas and in Arizona. And I don't have 4,000 loans. Then I would have to go back to probably the model of <laughs> the credit and the, and the thing. So we have a little bit of a niche that we've carved out. And I think, um, you know, I think, like I said, I'd be happy to, to review anything anybody, anybody has. And um, the good thing is you get a free look at what we think. Uh, whether it's right or wrong, and I've been wrong a million times. I get the emails, you know, four months, <laughs> sold it 30,000 more than you thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm saying the bar, you know, but, but like I said, we'll give you an honest approach. And like I said, we've built a little bit of a, of a data exchange a pulse in the market because I know what three bedroom, two baths in Linden should be going for because maybe we've lent on two here or we know what's going on. So, 
because we have that, that niche and, and New Jersey's our background, our, our backyard, I like to think that's why we could be a little bit advantageous for you guys if, if you need to, to leverage us. And it's just, lastly, and the bottom line is, you know, just like anything else, go with who you're comfortable with. Um, people will come to us sometimes and, you know, we just say, listen, talk to Joe, talk to Alice, whatever, just and who you're comfortable with, who, who, can, who can give you the service that you need, uh, who can perform. You know, there's a lot of lenders in this market. Like they said, the, the market's saturated. There's plenty of money out there. So just, you know, even like Ben's can go anywhere that he wants, and we're going to grab him soon, but he can, he can go anywhere. And my last closing marks is when you were talking about the men and a lot of ladies uh, that are in this business, I have to tell you, and sorry, guys, um, we've lent to and I've gone partners with uh, a, a lot of ladies, and boy, I'll tell you, you guys get the projects done. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> Because even though when we do our workshops and everything, and I train a lot of you know investors and agents, and we'll, we'll tell them and the guys will say, yeah, you know, Glenn said to do it this way, but you know, what? I think if I do it, it's like we can't take directions. I think we could do it that way. <laughs> the ladies, man, they go, he said this, I'm doing this, and if he's wrong, forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all like basically, it's basically the same thing for all of us. It's like we raise the money to friends, like you know, like me. If I'm friends, let's say, with Christopher Goodson who's in the back, who's an investor, you know, I'm doing a deal, I could call Chris, and like, Chris, I'm doing this deal, you know, I'm short $50,000, you know, that's what it is. Yeah, I know you got me. You always got me. So normally, I deal with people with, who's more on a higher level of brain, who's not thinking of money. Because when you deal with a, some, with a regular person, they got a little $40,000, you go ask them for that, that's their life saving. Me, I'd rather deal with more so with people that's in, in business. It's like, okay, Jonathan, listen, I'm doing this deal. I'm going to need $50,000 to do this deal. I'm closing on this house next week, even though the house never, never closed on time. So he'll understand that the house is not closing on time. I'm not trying to take his money. So I try to deal with people that understand business a little bit m better, and then it was able to have an open-minded and then that's how, for me, I operate to, to get deals done. And then with some of the lenders that I deal with, it's all about the relationship. Relationship, always tell them the truth. Tell them exactly this is what it is. Hey, listen, I'm doing this deal. I need fit. I'm, I'm supposed to come to the table with 50 grand. I don't have the money as of yet. Let's try to make the deal work. This is what it is. This is what it is. Or based on the relationship, they might say, well, I put up the money. This is what it is. What kind of equity are you going to give me into the deal or whatever? But one thing you have to remember, if it's only one deal that you're doing, you feel like they're taking your money. But if you got 10 deals, a little percentage, doesn't really matter. You just keep going because you just need to grow. In order to grow, you have to give in order for you to receive. That's that's all I have to say. <laughs> uh, and remember, it's not the cost of money; it's the availability of it. Yes, right. I agree. Yeah, and, and that, that's why I said like it's very important to know where you are in your situation because you may be at a place where if you have less money, then you have to give a little bit more. My whole thing. Get to the table. That, that's my mantra when into this business. It's going to be my mantra forever. Get to the table, however you got to get it done, whoever you got to ask, and just make sure you analyze it so that you're still going to make money and that you don't just work for the lender, right? And that you evaluated your deal correctly and you, you will be able to continue. Even if you could have made 15, 20K more, you make it up on the next one. So, you know. And we all, we all in life are the numbers. If I ask anybody in this room, it's like, whatever deal you want to do, everybody's going to say different things. I might ask you how much you want to make on the deal, you're going to say 50000 This one might say 100 It might be 30 It might be 20 So we all have numbers. At the end of the day, I, look at, I don't look at other people's pocket. What I look at is what's coming to me. If I'm, go if I'm going to do a deal, Glenn tells me it's going to be two points. I analyze how many months I'm going to have the money to repay him, and then I do my subtraction. When I know that number, if I like what I see on the paper, I'm going to start smiling. And then I'm yeah, going to say, that's yeah, my that's deal. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Uh, again, one thing, uh, like Bigger Pockets has said, it's a big real estate uh, forum. 50% uh, of something is better than 100% of nothing. I agree. Mm -hmm. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, what are some common, as an investor, what are some common obstacles that you guys face? Permits. We have, enough, we have enough time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where, where do 
I start? Um, right now, nah, the bad stuff. I can tell you all about the bad stuff too. So, um, I I ran into oil tank problems where I was wholesaling the deal, thought I was gonna make a lot, ended up making maybe five grand on it. Um, and I did a lot of work, had to pay over 20 something grand because the, the oil tank um, needed to be remediated. It hit groundwater. So one charge after another charge after another charge. Um, that was a really bad, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I didn't lose, but you know, um, definitely what wasn't my intent going into it. I could have did a lot, <laughs> a lot of other things to make 5K. Um, <laughs> you know, um, so that that was one. Uh, you know, really with contractors, that's a whole nother event that we feel like we need to just do. <laughs> getting into managing contractors well, Joey's and, and permits. <laughs> um, but but that's that's where you really, that's really where the downfall is. Um, your your renovation. Uh, your renovations, getting through, actually budgeting your project correctly, and you know not running out of money, right, to finish it, and that's that's really just obviously navigating those things, and then obviously having a few projects and not biting off more than you can chew, because those things can come back to bite you as well. So like. It's a combination of managing and really staying on top of that budget, which I can tell you, just I'm, I can't speak for all of them, but I can tell you all of my projects have gone over budget, and I'm not proud of that, but it's the reality. You know what I mean? And fortunately, I keep, a, I keep cushion so I can finish or get through it, but those are the things that can trap you if you, you, know, you run into that scenario. Um, but yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a great, uh, a great point. And just to pick from the lending side, when you go out and borrow the hard money and they're holding back 75000 and they're giving you the draws, if you have a mishap with your contractor or you're not on schedule, you're not going to be able to draw that money from the, from the hard money lender. So I think what you said was important. He has a cushion, right? So if you had to change contractors or if it's going to cost you more, you just have to remember when you borrow your, your hard money and they're holding it in, in the escrow, you know, you have to meet a certain milestone before they're going to release that 10000 to you. So we see a lot of, you know, I spend probably half my day on the problems. Um, you know, borrower and contractor disputes where maybe a contractor doesn't finish or a borrower mismanages the money. Um, so like I said, yeah, the, the contracting, yeah, the contracting, the contracting you know, topic is a, is a huge one. But, um, but I think, you know, we see, we see a lot of that with, with managing your GC if you're going to hire a GC. It's just, like I said, I mean, I, I, I did a deal, I think, in Union. I mismanaged the contractor when I was 25 years old. And I think at the closing, we went to the closing in Red Bank, and, and my check was like $1,500. And I remember, I think you said to me, you better kiss that. He goes, because you were like a couple this, that's another, but losing 10000 So I, And like things like that are things that stick in my head. I'll never forget. So when he told us about it, you know, Uncle Nunzio, you know, the contract's not around anymore. Yeah. But... Um, <laughs> No, and that's true. That, that's probably the second most important uh, component of this whole business is is getting the work done. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, the selling price uh, is the first thing that you have to really, 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 really be on point with. Okay, not so much today because everything sells for fifty thousand or seventy thousand <laughs> over the asking price. But seriously, mm -hmm. the ARV, the after period value, needs to be right on point, and then it's getting the work done. So. You know, make sure you get good quality cr contractors. Don't always be trustworthy. trustworthy, and it's not always the lowest bidder that wins. Okay, it's kind of like Paul said before, but, uh, comparing apples and app to apples with the lending. Same thing with the contractors. Are they giving you the same scope of work? If someone's at eighty thousand and someone's at fifty thousand, something's wrong in, in that right range. And nobody should be thirty thousand apart at those levels. Okay, you could be thirty thousand apart if it's you know. Uh, 870 and 840, different. But in that 100 to 150 thousand dollars, it's got to be real close. So that's why they always say to get the three estimates. So one's at 80, one's at 70, you know, one's at 87. You know, it's probably around 80, 80, 80 thousand. Now if someone's coming in at 100, and the other two are at 80 and 70. Well, the 100's too high. Okay, but you really need to zero in on that and get quality contractors that are going to all say it, that are going to show up and get the work done. Very important. That's where most, if not all, deals fail by getting the work done. Yeah. Another thing I like to say is, uh, if if this is a flip that you're looking to do, uh, one of the big things that does matter is 
I, I would say like the buyer's agent sometimes. Like if I know uh, like Oscar is submitting an offer, you know, there's a good chance that you know I know it's going to be a smooth transaction. There's been plenty of times where I've had like buyer's agents, uh, like their buyer stall for whatever reason, um, and there's been. Oh, yes, we're getting to the closing table. Okay, let's wait for the clear to close. It never happens. I have to put it back on the market. Back under contract, yes. Uh, do it all. Then the same thing happens. Like something that should have been sold in six months turns into a year, and you're that close to paying that additional point with, with certain lenders uh, just because you're at that point. Um, then, there, what else is there? Uh, just small inspection items that might be an issue. Uh, the township with uh, their c permits, their CO, uh, you know, building inspection, little things. Like I know East Orange is probably n one of the worst towns to ever work with in the history of history uh, when it comes <laughs> yeah like I remember uh, once they gave me like a five page list of items of things that they needed corrected and one of them was like dent in tub and it like I was like no way these are all new tubs so I look I look at the dent I like touch it it's freaking spackle <laughs> like or like I'm just like what Whatever, like you couldn't just touch it and like remove it. Like, anyways, I, I digress. That you know, like, there's a lot of different issues that you're gonna have to face. The thing is that you just have to be willing to, uh, you know, like, when you get kicked down, to get back up and just do it over again and hur you know jump over the next hurdle. Like, I wish I could say that every every deal is gonna be easy. It's really not. I think there's probably only been like one or two easy deals we've had this whole year. And even then, they still had their own issues. Yeah. And just to, yeah, 100%. Those two deals I gave you earlier were my best, but I got 100 more horror stories that you know, I learned from, you guys can learn from, but we don't have enough time. But the other thing that we really didn't speak on is title. Um, when you're dealing with distressed properties, you're going to run into so many title issues um, and having learning how to navigate through title um, can be a game changer for you. So I would tell you if you're dealing in distress, um, run a preliminary title up front and at least see what is on title because usually there are judgments that have to be paid. Um, there could be uh, tax liens, there could be federal tax liens that all have to be negotiated, HOA that have to be negotiated. So that's where a lot of the value is with distressed properties. Nobody wants to deal with that. A lot of agents don't want to deal with that because it takes time. That's why sometimes a short sale can take six months to a year to close because you, you're putting in a lot of work to get that deal that you're waiting for. Now, you know, everybody doesn't have that patience or their model is different, but title is very important um, to, to navigate through. Before we interrupt, you know, we have somebody here, actually, so let me come up real quick. Come on, uh, Celine. From New World Title. I don't know if anybody's heard of New World Title, but let's give him here. Waiting to get you know a couple of minutes in, and, and I apologize. <laughs> but, oh, you know, that's crazy. But now, Saeed, Saeed touched it. We got we got to bring him up here. Come, uh, get up front. Give him the mic. Give us a couple oh, of gems. Stand. How, I can stand. You, yeah, how, yeah. how can you help us? Hey. How can you help? How you doing? Uh, everybody, you know, protect themselves. <laughs> what kind of advice can you give? God, I mean, uh, coming from the title side, I would say it's of paramount importance. I I know. So this year alone, I had three different investors, three that regulars at the auctions, right? And they purchased these properties maybe three, four years ago. And they're calling me up and said, Celine, um, I, I just got some type of legal action or something like that. They're starting, you know, they're saying whatever, we have the judgment that was uncovered, what do I do? All three of these individuals that were investors actually never had an owner's policy on their home, uh, on the home, and it was investment properties. And all of them ended up having to pay out of pocket 50000 80000 100000 they had to come out of pocket on this just because they never had the owner's policy. These were cash transactions that they bought, um, so they didn't, you know, have a lender's policy on them. But a lot of times, I've worked with investors that are, you know what, I want to save a few dollars, right? And if your margins are based on t 
title, right? <laughs> and you're not getting a policy because it, you know you're, it's going to come into your margins, then maybe you should look for like finding those margins elsewhere. Just because it might not happen now, like and these. His own, you know, brokerage has done dozens and dozens. The other one, household name, if you go to uh, Passaic County uh, Sheriff's Auctions, everyone knows who this is, and so on and so forth. Obviously, they're not going to disclose this. I know it just because, you know, being part of the title and them approaching me, like, hey, what kind of solutions do we have to kind of protect ourselves? But, long story short, you know, the title is of paramount importance. I would say, like, you know, it, it's part of a team, right? You have your lender. You have your attorney, right? You have your agent, but title needs to be a core component. And where title comes in is, A, you want to work with a title company that obviously works with investors, which New World Title uh, does. We work with a lot of investors. We work with developers. And, you know, we, it's also a title company that's not going to delay your transaction because sometimes timing is everything in these deals, right? And you want to get to the closing table as quickly as possible. Um, preliminary title search, obviously, very important. One of the things that we do is if you order that search, um, and you know, especially with some of our regular investors, <clears throat> when you're doing these searches, we're not charging you extra. Whatever the cost is, we're going to pass it along to you. But beyond that, we roll that into your policy if you end up getting a policy. You know, sometimes you do 10 searches, but you're only binding one because you only closed on one transaction. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, in title, we're searching, as I said, it's not clear title. There's judgments, liens, any type of encumbrances that are happening that are associated with this property. And what you want to do is uncover, say, you know, what is actually happening with this transaction or this, this property. And you want to, at the end of the day, the lender is going to require that there's clear title before we close the property because no one wants to assume that risk or that exposure, right? The lender is going to protect their investment no matter what. As you as an owner, as an investor, also want to protect your investment no matter what. So if the lender's requiring it, you know, there's a reason for that, right? And so similarly, we're going to go in there and if we're doing the searches and then we're binding the policy, we're at, and by that we're saying we're giving you coverage. You own this property, you're completely protected. If two years down the line someone comes and says, hey, this is actually my property or my brother's property and we have the legal right to it. Now you have coverage from this exposure and so that's thank you for asking that question um and you know obviously there's so much that goes into title um and i think it's probably one of the more complicated aspects of the real estate transaction which is why you want to have a team that you can trust you want to make sure that attorney i don't know if there's any attorneys here right now um that are that are present but obviously you know every th this panel here has done hundreds if not thousands of transactions between all of them and they're getting deals done. So, you know, talk to the experts of, that, are, that are here, that know how to get the deals done, that know which attorneys to really utilize, that aren't going to also, no one wants to work with an attorney or title company that are deal killers, right? We don't want to kill the deal. If you don't close on the deal, and we don't, that means we don't make money. No one is making money. So the, at the end of the day, you want to work. And I'm going to say, a lot of times we are the bad guy. We're going to be like, look, there's obviously a major defect on title, you know, whatever it is. Um, and, and, but when we say no, we can't close a deal, it's not because we don't want to close your deal. We want to protect you, right? We're here to protect you. So sometimes we do have to be the bad guy. Exactly. Thank you. And I really want to give a shout out to George Conciabello, Chris Delgado, Lifestyle International for hosting such an amazing event. Let's give a round of applause to them.